Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Lars uh, Benson, and I'm the uh, director of the Africa program here at the Center for International uh, Private Enterprise, or SITE. Um, I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, webinar uh, on procurement reform and monitoring emergency spending. This is a virtual event featuring three speakers from Africa. This conference is the 12th in a series of public events on COVID-19 and corruption which is being organized by our Anti-Corruption and Governance Center. Today's event, we will be focusing on issues with government procurement at the time of, height, of a heightened emergency spending. As we all know, uh, during the COVID-19 emergency, the risk of procurement corruption has had a severe implication for every country on the continent, especially those with vulnerable populations and limited resources. With that in mind, the business community must play a critical role in supporting broader oversight efforts in terms of public service delivery, innovation, corruption, uh, anti-corruption, by promoting ethical practices. As you can probably tell already, today's topic is a complex one. And I'm anticipating uh, especially an interesting Q&A segment with our speakers. With this in mind, I am pleased to pass the mic to someone who is a master at making sense of complex situations, especially when they involve corruption. Please welcome as moderator my colleague, Lola Adekanye, who heads up SIPE's business uh, integrity work in Africa and put this panel together. Thank you, Lola. Thank you very much, Lars. Um, good morning to some of us and good afternoon to everyone on the call. Thank you so much for calling in and thank you very much to our panelists. Um, we have a very interesting um, conversation to, to dive into, so I would uh, not waste too much time, um, you know, giving any further background. Uh, we would, by the end of today, be talking about procurement reform priorities. We'll be talking about the role um, of uh, the non-governmental actors in trying to get countries, emerging eco economy countries and, and countries across Africa to a point where we actually have smart, streamlined procurement systems um, that are, you know, resilient enough to withstand challenges like the one we're going through currently, and the, you know, increased risk of corruption that's plagued the procurement system um, in many countries. So, um, with us today is Carrie Klotz. I will quickly read Carrie's citation and allow Carrie to come on with, with uh, her presentation before I read the citation of our two other very interesting um, uh, panelists whose um, background you may have seen in the invitation. So Carrie is currently a Fulbright Clinton Fellow placed with Sodemi, the national mining company at Cote d'Ivoire in West Africa. She's conducting a study on the socioeconomic impact on artisanal gold mining. Um, Carrie's been working, her current fellowship with the World Bank is focusing on good governance in the extra extractive industries, primarily in Francophone Sub-Saharan Africa, but she's also been working on the open contracting and, and global movement to promote disclosure and participation um, in public contracting. So I'll hand over to Carrie to tell us a lot about the progress and success that um, the open contracting uh, project has made in several countries or around the world. Um, so, Kari, over to you. Great. And can everyone hear me okay? Yes, please go ahead. Fantastic. I can hear you. Um, so, thanks so much for having me. It's, it's <laughs> always wonderful to see a lot of interest in something as <clears throat> allegedly boring as public procurement. Um, and I'm actually based in Washington, D.C. at the moment, and it's interesting to me that it's been the global disruption of COVID-19 that's finally helped my family in North Carolina understand why procurement is actually not boring. Um, and I'll speak a little bit about why it's actually at the core of an effective and efficient response to the crisis. Um, so my name is Carrie Klutz, as Lola said, I'm currently head of country programs at the Open Contracting Partnership. Um, and for those who don't know, uh, Open Contracting Partnership is a silo busting collaboration. Um, and we work to open up and transform public contracting around the world. Uh, we work across the entire chain of public contracts, and so that's from planning through tender and award, the contract itself, and then through the implementation of those contracts and delivery. Um, and our aim is ensuring fundamentally better, smarter public contracting for all citizens. 
We spun out of the World Bank about six years ago. <clears throat> and we're now a nonprofit organization providing free technical assistance to governments, businesses, CSOs, media, and others that are interested in implementing open contracting. We're currently working in over 40 countries, as well as cities and regions across the world, including in Nigeria, at both federal and state level, and in South Africa, as well as um, a handful of other countries across the continent. Um, our work with partners around the world has shown over the years that open contracting can make a big difference when it's done right. And by that, I mean when there's timely, high quality open data that's accessible. When business and citizens have a voice to speak and government has an ear to listen, uh, open contracting has led to significant savings as well as improved citizens, uh, citizen services and importantly increased opportunities for the private sector. Um, so on to the next slide, please. Oh, that's a good one. Nope, back one. Um, yes, perfect. So at Open Contracting Partnership, we're used to having to make the case for why procurement is important. Until now, um, when COVID-19, which is, a, as we know, an unprecedented global health crisis, um, it's put the murky, obscure world of government contracting in the spotlight like never before. Unfortunately, showing the dire human consequences of awarding public contracts in secret. So governments have spent at least $100 billion on COVID-19 contracts in the first four months of the pandemic as they scrambled to secure medical supplies. And low levels of transparency, digitization, and coordination created a Hunger Games type scenario as hospitals and public health agencies, local and national governments competed among one another to purchase essential medicine, equipment, and supplies. Even in normal circumstances, public procurement is government's number one corruption risk. Um, an OECD study from a couple years ago reported that 57% of foreign bribes were paid in connection with a public contract. And unfortunately, in the current context, there are people that are taking advantage of the chaos to enrich themselves at the expense of medical staff and patients. And I know we've all seen the stream of media reports on COVID procurement gone wrong. Across the world, millions and millions of dollars have been squandered on questionable purchases, including things like ventilators that never arrived in Israel, counterfeit masks and test tubes that turned out to be just soda bottles in the US. And we even saw a case where a raspberry farm scored a $6 million contract to supply ventilators in Bosnia. There's also the devastating economic impact of COVID-19, which we all know too well. Um, and I think we all saw that the World Bank has warned the current, current COVID-19 contract, excuse me, crisis <clears throat> could undo decades of global poverty reduction. And so those huge economic costs mean it's smarter more efficient government spending is more important than ever before. So we all need to work together to ensure that these purchases are not only efficient, but equitable, and to ensure that the response to COVID and the ultimate recovery benefit all communities, as well as the companies that want an opportunity to do business with governments, to help them be able to trust the systems and benefit from the huge amounts being spent through public contracts. So the next slide, what can be done? Um, as the IMF Managing Director said at the beginning of the crisis, um, <clears throat> governments need to spend more money more quickly, but they need to keep the receipts. And what we've seen is that it's possible to do even better than this. You can buy fast and also accountably at the same time. Throughout the crisis, we've been supporting our partners in government and civil society to collect, publish, and monitor data about the planning, award, and delivery of COVID-19 contracts. We've also helped them to better coordinate demand and supply through market consultation and flexible purchase arrangements, um, such as lining up a central list of verified suppliers that individual purchasers like hospitals and health departments can use quickly and easily. We've also supported civil society, media, researchers, and oversight authorities to monitor the COVID-19 emergency procurements for signs of corruption, mismanagement, or inequitable distribution. Next slide. As a result, we've come up with five recommendation areas to help countries improve the effectiveness of their COVID-19 response and recovery efforts, centered around policy, coordination, data, partnerships and analyses, and civic monitoring. And the link at the bottom has, has more information on those for those that are interested. Um, I'll now give a quick tour du monde with a few specific examples um, where we've seen countries that are exemplifying each of these points. Um, and we've also seen that those that had already implemented open contracting reforms before the crisis hit have been better able to pivot quickly to curb corruption and increase the effectiveness of COVID contracting. So next slide starts our trip around the world. Um, first, we'll head to South America, 
where Paraguay was an early champion of open contracting. Um, and when the COVID-19 crisis hit, our partners there quickly moved to ensure flexibility and accountability of emergency purchases. So they worked with us to ensure identification and publication of COVID-19 contracts and required information on those to be published within 10 days. They also ensured that the public could easily monitor COVID-19 purchases by establishing a dedicated searchable webpage, dashboard, and mobile app to send notifications of newly awarded contracts. Journalists also began identifying and reporting on irregular procurements in the media. There was one crazy story where a state-owned enterprise bought huge volumes of tonic water at five times the market price because it was allegedly helpful in um, protecting against coronavirus. Um, so as a result of stories like these, the procurement authority issued a new requirement that reference prices also be published for these purchases. And we're working with researchers now to further analyze COVID-19 procurement to give additional feedback on how to detect and prevent inefficiencies as well as corruption. The open contracting approaches not only help Paraguay to prevent corruption in COVID-19 procurement, but also help them be more agile in their ability to purchase the needed goods, works, and services. Inspired by others in the open contracting community, uh, the procurement authority issued an open call to the public for suppliers to identify themselves and their capacity to deliver those needed services and supplies. And they then used this information to create a registry of suppliers of emergency items that was available to all public buyers. Next slide, please. So now we're head over to Ukraine, where the state-owned enterprise Medical Procurement of Ukraine, uh, which is responsible for centralized healthcare procurement, used contracting data for better planning, supplier engagement, civic monitoring, and strategic communication. A coalition of government reformers and civil, civil society uh, also worked to put all of Ukraine's COVID-19 related tenders in the public domain. And this is now required by law within 24 hours. Um, they made them available for ex post monitoring as well as future audits. And civil society, as you see here, is actively monitoring contract awards, such as the prices for masks, gloves, and ventilators, and also doing comparisons among entities and looking at specific suppliers too. Next slide. Now we'll fly over to Nigeria, uh, where OCP has been working with the Bureau of Public Procurement for some years, um, and most recently helping to publish and track COVID-19 specific procurement. Um, it's in part related to the commitment tied to IMF funding to Nigeria. Um, unfortunately, it's PDF at the moment, but it's a start, so hoping to build from there. Um, and at the same time, we've also been supporting an awesome coalition of local civil society partners, uh, including the Public and Private Development Center, as well as other CSOs such as Budget and Code. Um, to access and use the data for advocacy and monitoring and to feed back to the government. Um, and thanks to this, we've already seen an improvement in the information that MDAs, ministries, departments, and agencies um, are submitting to be published by BPP as a result of this feedback. Um, and so now we're really excited to be working with partners to translate those improvements into non-COVID procurement as well, so hoping to build on that momentum. Um, at state level in Nigeria, we're also actively supporting the Nigerian Governors Forum through a World Bank funded project to bring e-procurement systems to the states. We've seen a huge interest from over a dozen states so far in open contracting and the open contracting data standard. And we're helping to ensure that contracting information related to COVID and beyond is available publicly as good quality open data. And then on down to South Africa, where we were pleased to see the recent presidential declaration around improving transparency and procurement. And this reiterates our longstanding work to engage the Office of the Chief Procurement Officer, as well as National Treasury. Um, and that includes recently submitting comments to the draft procurement bill that hopefully will be updated and passed uh, in the near future. Um, we're also working with a range of South African CSOs to advocate for real change in the way things are done. And as I think Francois will reiterate shortly, uh, to ensure that policies that exist are actually implemented. Um, and next slide, if you will, the last one. Uh, so we've written up these and more examples on our website. Um, we've also got a COVID-19 specific page that has resources as well as um, additional country examples. And I'm happy to share further information through the question and answers and also in the chat. Um, but beyond these examples, we've also seen open contracting makes a real difference for patients in healthcare outside of COVID. Um, and we know that there are still so many challenges facing supply chain management in healthcare specifically and more broadly. Um, and as we look toward the recovery that I know we all hope is coming soon, we know the challenges are going to continue. <clears throat> and that's especially true in the crucial areas of healthcare, infrastructure, and helping to rebuild the hard hit SME sector. So at Open Contracting Partnership, we're actively thinking about these issues and we're really keen to discuss further with any on the call or further afield that are interested. 
And I think as we go from this conversation about the current crisis, it's especially important to remember that the challenges of corruption and inefficiency are a wider problem um, in both our healthcare and procurement systems more generally around the world. So we need to remember to continue investing in transparency and accountability improvements. Um, and I think in this case, we all know that value for money isn't just fiscal savings, but it's actually saving lives. Thanks. Thank you so much, Harry. Um, I think a, a lot of things were fascinating in your, in, in your presentation, and it's great that we're going to continue this conversation with um, Dr. Shopper's uh, drilling down into all of the work she's done over the last uh, almost two decades, researching procurement reform priorities and opportunities um, in several African countries. I think the interesting thing um, about the fact that, as, as you were saying, Harry, um, many of the countries that are responding well were able to quickly respond to the challenges brought on by the need to quickly spend during the pandemic. Um, they were champions of the open contracting process. They had, a, they had procurement systems that were working towards being um, strong and resilient and responsive to the challenges in, in public spending. Um, in many countries on, on, in Africa, um, the systems are partly, mostly um, not digital and data collection is really patchy. Um, and then there's, the, you know, with that, there are all these other challenges with um, political interference and political influence. And I'll hand over to Dr. Shope, uh, but before I do, I'll just quickly read her, her, her bio. Um, very shortly because I know we want to get into the meat of this, but I, I would, um, I'll give you a quick insight into how much work Professor and Dr. Chopin Williams Elegbe um, has done. She's the head of the head of department of the Mercantile Law and the deputy director of the African Procurement Law Unit at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. She specializes in public procurement law um, and anti-corruption law, sustainable development law, and commercial law. She's the author, author of over 50 publications in the area of anti-corruption and public procurement law. And she's also the editor of multiple law journals. Uh, she's currently a member of the Transparency International's Working Group on Debarment and Exclusion. And she has an LLM from the London School of Economics and a PhD in public procurement and anti-corruption from the University of Nottingham, um, UK. Dr. Shopper, please go ahead with your presentation. Hi, everyone. Can you see and hear me properly? Yes, we can. Excellent. Thank you so much for, for that introduction, um, Alola. It's, it's really a pleasure to be, to be on the call. Um, okay, so in, in 10 minutes, I'll just give a, a brief overview of what's been happening. I'm also focusing on, on Nigeria and South Africa, uh, partly because, as, as you heard from, from Alola, I'm based in South Africa, but I, I am from Nigeria. And my, my work in public procurement has focused on, on African countries, West African countries, and, and South Africa as well. So I'll, I'll give a few um, um, remarks on, on what's been going on. Um, so just uh, maybe to start and to give an overview of, of how a lot of African countries approached pandemic procurement, um, and that which was really similar to, to all the other countries of the world. Um, so of course, the focus was on the use of, of emergency procurement um, um, procedures. In, in South Africa, we, um, it's, 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 it's called deviating from procurement. And in South Africa, you can deviate from procurement um, for, for, for three main reasons, um, either because there's an emergency, which obviously the pandemic was, or because it is impractical to use um, competitive procurement procedures, or because there's only one person or supplier who can supply the goods in question. Um, so there was a lot of, of reliance on using emergency procure, um, procurement procedures. And what this just means in practice is that you don't have to go to a competitive tender. You don't have to advertise. Um, you can do what we, can, what we call sole contracting or direct contracting. You basically pick a supplier and, and you go with that supplier um, without any of, of the, the formal processes um, for competition. And so we saw that, of course, a lot in South Africa. We also saw that in, in Nigeria as well. Um, and in Nigeria, ordinarily for, for contracts over a certain threshold, you need to have some kind of approval. Um, of course, if they're federal contracts um, and not state government contracts. So for federal contracts over a certain threshold, you need to have um, you know, some approval from the Bureau of Public Procurement, which, which Carrie mentioned in her presentation. But in terms of emergencies, those approvals are, are dispensed with. 
So again, a lot of direct contracting with, with um, suppliers selected by, by procurement officials in, in whatever way they, they, they can. Um, so in South Africa and Nigeria, the pandemic responses, of course, were not just in terms of health goods, things like, you know, of course, ventilators, sanitizers, P, uh, PPEs. But of course, there was a lot of procurement in, 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 in the education um, sector and of, in, in Nigeria and South Africa, and I guess in a lot of developing countries, there was a lot of procurement for um, social welfare. So distribution of food parcels um, to, vulnerable, um, to vulnerable, communi vulnerable communities. The other thing that we had was a lot of, of grants or cash transfers to assist different, different population groups. So the risks that we saw um, in, in, in Africa, as, as well as in, in other countries in the world, is the same thing. We had a lot of fraud. We had a lot of corruption. Um, we had a lot of contracts going to non-responsible contractors, contractors who you know, had been registered solely for that purpose that hadn't been in business, or contractors who, for instance, in, in, in one of the provinces in South Africa, you had um, millions of, of, of dollars worth of contracts going to, uh, for, PP, for PPEs going to a construction company. I think Carrie mentioned the Raspberry Farm, um, you know, getting contracts for PPEs. So we had a lot of that as well. Um, contractors that ordinarily should not have access to government contracts, at least for those particular items, being given contracts for those items. Of course, we also had a lot of conflicts of interest. We had a lot of contracts going to politically ex exposed persons. Um, and at the moment, there's a big investigation in, 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 in South Africa over a, a contract worth of, or contracts worth two billion rands, um, which, which went to politically exposed persons, um, which obviously is, is, is a hell of a lot of money. Um, so non-delivery, substandard delivery, we also had organized criminals taking advantage of, of the chaos caused by, the, um, by the, the pandemic. Another problem that we found was that we, uh, our technology in procurement and, it, and also in, in the payment of, of these cash transfers I mentioned, our technology systems were not agile enough to respond to the pandemic. So I think um, Lola mentioned in one of her comments that a lot of processes are very manual. Um, but in South Africa, it, it, it's not really about being manual, but the fact that many of these government databases are not joined up. So for instance, in relation to payment of, of grants, there was a lot of double dipping because uh, you know, people just go to the different government departments who's giving out the different grants, um, even though that was not supposed to be the case. So we've had that challenge. In fact, at, at the moment, there's um, about 30,000 um, people who received cash transfers were not actually supposed to have received them. Some of them are government employees, some of them are still in employment um, or, or didn't qualify, but, but they were able to get these payments. So we've had um, those problems um, uh, um, coming up in procurement as well as in, in the distribution of, of cash resources. Um, and these were for different reasons. And I think Carrie has mentioned that apart from the pressure caused by the pandemic, um, there were a lot of skeletal services. So there was a lot less supervision um, over the normal procurement processes because not everyone was working um, at the same scale or had access to, you know, to, to, to do the work. Um, so these are the challenges that we have faced. Um, we did have some successes. Of course, we, we saw that Africa's, um, the impact of the pandemic or the health impact of the pandemic on Africa has been a lot better than other regions. Um, so we were able to scale up our, our health responses. And of course, we've had experience in dealing with communicable and non-communicable diseases. So we, we could you know, um, use that experience to, to our advantage in this situation as well. So in terms of, of what we, what's happening right now, um, in, in South Africa um, and in Nigeria, to a lesser extent, there are a lot of investigations going on, there are a lot of prosecutions going on. And I think that the role that, that businesses and, and, and civil society can play is the role that they've, they've always played. So, um, you know, whistleblowing, ensuring that if, you know, if people know something, they say something. A lot of the, the prosecutions that are ongoing um, started because someone blew the whistle, right? Someone, someone actually um, let the cat out of the bag. Um, CSOs can do what it is that, that they've always done, following the money, um, you know, ensuring that they, 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 they track and trace these payments that, that have been made that are, that are under investigation. Um, and I think that in, in countries like South Africa and Nigeria, I think that beyond the um, openness of, of, of data, which, which Harry has talked about, I think that we need to give more support for the idea of, of beneficial ownership, for, uh, for ensuring that the data on people who actually own these companies is made available 
not and as well as the contracting information because like the portal in Nigeria that Carrie mentioned about, it has the names of companies, but we have no idea who the faces are, who the names are behind those companies. And I think that, uh, that the work of, of Open um, Ownership, which is an organization that, that is pushing for more um, access to beneficial data in public procurements is really crucial. Um, and I think in terms of businesses, uh, for those businesses that I said that know something, voluntary disclosure is, you know, is always welcome. Um, because these are the ways in which we'll know what the, where the gaps are, are, are really are in, in relation to public procurement. Um, the other thing that I'll say is that, especially in relation to, to South Africa, um, I think it's, it's really time for us to have a conversation about having an, an, an open digital ecosystem. So I mentioned earlier that a lot of the challenges we had um, are because our tech systems are, are out of date, they're not joined up, um, so different... Um, different public um, agencies have different databases. One of the challenges that was faced by SASA, which is a social grants administration um, body, was that they didn't have complete databases. So they would have to go from, from you know, home affairs to, the, to our, our version of internal revenue called SARS in order to try to get the information on who um, are legitimate people for payments. And because they don't have complete databases, some of the payments were made to people who are dead um, to make to students, made to people who are underage. And I said 30,000 people receive payments that they, they, they ought not to have. So I think that's one of the conversations we have to have is in relation to the technology that we're using, not just in, in, in public procurement, but really across the public sector. I mean, we're in 2020 and we shouldn't still be having um, these outdated systems that don't actually work for us and are not flexible enough to be deployed um, you know, when, when we're in, in an emergency or in a crisis or outside of the normal situation. Um, so, I mean, those are the things that, that, that I'll talk about. I think um, the, the last point would be in terms of records. Um, record keeping is, is a big problem in South Africa as well as in Nigeria. And we, we really need to, to have a conversation about that. The Auditor General's Office, um, which, you know, audits pub public body or public agencies, has always complained that in some agencies, they don't get any information on public contracts. So they cannot even actually audit those companies. And in the recent um, Auditor General's report on, on, on COVID-19 procurement, again, that was a, a highlighted as a major issue that many public departments do not keep records. You find very similar in Nigeria. So, you know, in terms of that, that that's a big um, risk if we cannot even investigate or, or find out what actually happened. So our records, our technology, um, and civil society support for, for tracking money um, is, is, is crucial in, in the short and the medium term for getting over this pandemic. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Shepe. Um, a lot of things I, I, I'm uh, picking up from that, uh, um, and some of them buttressing some of what Carrie said and, and shedding some more light. Um, it's it's interesting that um, we we have that you know gap in collecting data and making sure that we use the data right and that our systems are are connected. In South Africa, I've heard you know that's also the challenge in Nigeria. Um, in our recent newsletter, the Cyber Anti-Corruption Africa newsletter that went out, we did highlight Kenya and South Africa um, for you know the current the scandals going on in in terms of COVID-19 procurement, and um, it really pointed to the fact that you know the procurement systems were. Um, so very siloed, the, the way of collecting data and keeping records were, had just too many gaps. Um, but one shout out was to the civic monitoring. The, the civic society in these countries um, at least were awake to the challenges. In Nigeria also is the case, the, the um, work that Carrie talked about. Um, and I, I hope we can get some time to drill down into those issues a little bit more. Um, and also to the beneficial ownership um, issues that you talked about. But I really want to go to Francois before we start, you know, having this uh, conversation. So um, I just, before we go to Francois, I just want to say to everyone, please do drop your questions um, in the Q&A um, box right there. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see that there are a few boxes. You see the um, participants probably, or, or if you don't have what I see, you would see Q and A. If you click on that, you can put your questions in there for, um, for Shopware or for 
um, uh, Carrie or for um, Francois, and we will take the questions after Francois' uh, 10 minutes presentation coming up right now. Um, just quickly to tell you a bit about Francois, uh, Francois is also based in South Africa, and he will be giving us um, what is sort of like the private sector um, perspective on the challenges of public procurement for a tender for a private sector company, a company that's bidding for, um, you know, to offer service or, or goods to, to the government, um, and really a solution that is pretty much a private sector um, led solution. And so Francois is a procurement supply specialist with over 20 years of experience in that field. Um, in the last 10 years of uh, managing and promoting better supply relationships, he's now utilizing a platform called Tender Just um, to counter tender corruption in, in South Africa. And potentially, um, you know, can, this, this is uh, replicable in other countries. So I'll hand over to Francois to talk to us a little bit about uh, the private sector perspective and experience in, um, in South Africa and what the priorities um, should be for uh, private sector, but also um, government and other stakeholders in reforming the procurement systems in, in South Africa. I'm just going to see if we have Francois on the call. I know I did see you earlier. Let's see. Um, okay. I'm... Um, I'm going to rely on Kai or Kaylin to just check if we have Francois on the call. Okay, I see Francois now. And yes, please go ahead, Francois. Can you hear us? Hear me? Lola, thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. That's fantastic. I um, had a small panic moment there. I lost my network connection, but... Um, Years ago, I, I was driving through Zimbabwe and I had to pay a lot of money for a wheel spanner and I complained about that and the owner just said to me, TIA, and I said, what is that? And he said, this is Africa. So uh, this is also one of those moments where we have to, <laughs> where we have to always uh, remember that we live in Africa. Um, but I'm back and, and hopefully you can all hear me. Thanks, uh, Lola and, uh, and Saif for the opportunity to engage in this discussion. Um, just a, a, a short word on, on Tender Just. You see, you'll see that on the slides. And Tender Just aims to eliminate tender corruption by creating transparency uh, of tender and contract information and then allowing the business community to collaborate and share information, discuss information uh, with each other. Um, and I will elaborate a little bit on this later, but firstly, I want to provide a view on the public procurement landscape in South Africa with particular focus on the corruption aspects. I will share my impression on the COVID-19 experience briefly. Uh, Professor William Telegby has, um, has given us a lot more information about that. Uh, but I'll give my uh, view on this and lastly share a little bit more about uh, tender just. Can we get the next slide, please? So over the next, over the past uh, 20 years, there's been significant policy reform and new legislation established to strengthen control over public procurement across Africa. In South Africa, we have a strong set of legislation and policies that should support an efficient, fair, and transparent public procurement system. A new procurement bill, as uh, Kerry has related a little earlier, is currently in the circulation to improve this further, but I do not believe that this will make the big difference that we are looking for. Procurement and supply skills uh, have improved, uh, and there's a lot of room for development, and we have, uh, and we have d decent systems in place, but, uh, you know, they're not the best systems, but I think they are sufficient to support these processes. Our big problem uh, is capacity in government, but in my view, the missing component is consequence management, as we'll see in the next slide. Thank you. I was getting a little bit worried there again for a bit. Um, here on the right, you'll, 
uh, you'll see uh, someone complaining about the previous mayor of Etiquini Metropolitan Municipality in Durban. Um, she was appointed as a member of the provincial parliament after being fired from her post in the metro since she was charged with major corruption and a solid waste tender. The public outcry uh, on uh, to this has forced the governing party to adopt a principle that individuals charged with corruption or criminal acts will step down from any leadership positions in the interim. So those are members of the governing party. In the past, accused politicians and officials have simply resigned and moved on to a new role. Um, and this lack of consequences for corrupt acts has removed all the value for better legislation and that uh, more sophisticated systems could bring. So corruption has two sides typically and consequence to offending supplier businesses are also lacking. Suppliers are typically listed on the database of restricted suppliers for a period of 10 years. In this graph, we can see that after years of little movement, adoption of this process seemed to be progressing well. Then in 2019, no suppliers were added and only three so far in 2020. And this amid so many allegations of corruption. If there are no consequences, people will not fear of being exposed. Uh, I think that yeah, is, is a key message. Now, another challenge is our prosecuting authority has been largely depleted in years of state capture, with the result that few cases have seen successful uh, prosecution. As you can see at the top left there, that the result is that no suppliers have been listed on the register for tender defaulters in terms of our Preventional and Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act. Again, no consequences. If we cannot sort out the consequences, it does not help to have good policy, good legislation, good systems and processes in place. On the next slide, um, we talk a bit about the, the COVID impact. So it's been an interesting year for most around the world. Uh, just after our lockdown in March, uh, the National Treasury published the emergency procurement instructions uh, with lists of suitable suppliers, price lists for PPE, uh, sanitation and other relevant items to help public servants uh, overcome this urgent need for procurement that, of items that they typically were not used to procure. I think public sector procurement supported the response uh, here locally in South Africa better than in many other countries, maybe because the, the take up of uh, infections were a lot slower than, than maybe has, has been seen elsewhere and we had more time to prepare. But the good that came out of this pandemic was once again for me initiated by investigative journalists in conjunction with whistleblowers that reported on the large scale corruption in COVID-19 related uh, procurement, particularly in PPE and maybe some other non-procurement non, uh, grant related aspects as uh, Professor Williams Allegri alluded to. Alluded to. Um, so with public patients very limited for this type of abuse, uh, government had to react very swiftly. The central government required all departments and provinces to report on PPE spend to National Treasury and the departments responded rather swiftly, uh, more impressive than, than I've seen in a while, which makes me think that the whip is being cracked in the, in the governing party. The Special Investigation Unit, now up and running and seemingly hungry to investigate these uh, cases, is now actively investigating all these actions. And hopefully we'll see uh, that they provide sufficient capability to the prosecuting authority to bring uh, these individuals to book. So to me, the biggest lesson from this experience, however, has been that one should differentiate very clearly between emergency and routine procurement uh, in a time like this. So we saw a relatively successful open tender system in the Gauteng province, which is the economic hub and, legis um, and government hub of South Africa. Um, that open tender system being shut down for all procurement at the start of April. And within two weeks, a major IT security tender was published and awarded within two days. That is one example of how officials and criminals in business will abuse the freedoms offered by more relaxed controls. 
so I think that's that's the lesson that I've learned here is that yeah, when you when you relax these controls for emergency um, procurements, you should maybe um, bring a category angle to that to uh, still retain your your controls over the rest of your procurement. Um, on the on the next slide, we talk about a bit about the the challenges for that suppliers face in in terms of uh, getting access to uh, accurate tender information. It's become practice for organs of state to publish tender notices on their website, in addition to tender uh, to newspapers and in tender bulletins. Some publish certain tender results and cancel tenders as well. Um, others provide space for this information on their website, but hardly ever publish any information. So we see a tendency for for more open um, more open publishing of, of tender information. Uh, that may well be a, a result of the work that the likes of Open Contracting Partnership has been doing uh, in this economy. But uh, as we're saying to complicate things, we're sitting with hundreds of different sources where suppliers need to search for this information. You see here 806 uh, government departments, municipalities, uh, agencies, or state-owned enterprises, as we call them, uh, tertiary institutions, uh, tertiary inst education institutions, and so forth. Uh, so this is not a simple task at all for suppliers. This has, however, been simplified by the central e-tenders pages of National Treasury, which covers a large portion of at least the tender adverts, but hundreds of these institutions still do not publish uh, in that location. So suppliers constantly have to search around and, and that's really what I try to illustrate on this on this slide is that you know there's a wide range of, of information sources and, it, and suppliers have to go and search. Um, nothing is is pushed um, to the suppliers. So the, uh, and you know, it, even with all this development I think there still seems to be a certain reluctance to publish contract and tender information too openly. You can get have good intentions from a national treasury, but down on the ground, uh, that may bring a little bit too much transparency for the liking of of uh, people involved in the in the day to day operations. The best way to address this is to convince all tiers of government to publish contract and tenure information in the open, in order to be held accountable by the public. I call this the inside out approach, where like the approach of the Open Contracting Partnership. One engages in advocacy, provides support and structures to help achieve this objective. In the absence of that willingness though, um, we are looking at the outside in approach where we collect whatever is available on the outside, enrich that knowledge with community, with, uh, enrich that information with knowledge that the community contributes, and then push that information to the community members. And maybe over time, this will force everyone to be more willing to publish in the open if they realize that information is, uh, is, is out there in any case. On the next slide, we look a bit more closer at Tender Just and what we're trying to do there. Now, I, I apologize, it's a very busy slide, but on the, the top right, we, we start, uh, we say in Tender Just, we create transparency by collecting and publishing tender information in the open. We allow suppliers to share new information from the coalface with each other, and then we give them the information and assistance to take an informed decision on these, the, the, the appropriate action that they, that, that they should take. Um, in a time of uncertainty, you know, this is not the field of expertise of most suppliers. It's, uh, it's typically something new to them if, if they're faced with, with a situation like this and we try to give them the, the right support in that process. So how do we do this? Uh, buyers typically publish tender and contract related information in a combination of newspapers, tender bulletins, websites, and in the actual procurement systems. Uh, our team consolidates all this information and then it's filtered and sent to the suppliers in, uh, that are part of the community to ensure that they only receive information relevant to their individual businesses. At some point, there's just too much information and you have to filter to, to make sure that it's relevant 
to the supplier's day-to-day -day, uh, work. Community members can contribute information which they get exposed to in the local environment. This enriches the pool of information and then is again shared with the community members who, show, who has shown an interest in that particular transaction. We encourage members to interact and share knowledge through the social features on the platform. Every member has a personal and the company profile and they can connect with their personal network of contacts. Information is shared via blogs, content pages, or wikis, and then discussion forums in the community. An online chat function also helps to uh, resolve on the spot discussions. When a member has a concern with any tender, they firstly have easy access to the relevant legislation and guides on the process to be followed. Once they are certain they want to report an irregularity, they can lodge a report and decide if they need a preliminary investigation by tender just engage their peers in discussion on the process, seek legal assistance, or to be linked to an anonymous, on an anonymous whistleblowing facility. On the next slide, uh, yeah, I think we, we're wrapping up. Uh, so we are in the development, where are we, where are we in the development cycle of the service? The base platform has been in existence for some time in Market Square, and recently we've expanded the functionality to provide for the specific needs of Tender Just. We have an experienced team who understands how and where to collect the tender information and feed that into the system. We need to improve our analytical capabilities to identify problem areas early and to focus our attention in the right places, but we are just about ready to go. Uh, in order for the solution to be successful, we need a critical mass of users, uh, typically supplier users, to contribute to the community. To make access as easy as possible, we'd like to make the service free to join. And therefore, we're looking to organize business, grant makers, and corporate donors to help crank this engine. The network and credibility that these types of organizations uh, can contribute will also help to, 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 to boost, the, boost the adoption. And then once the engine is running, we aim to support the service uh, with a combination of voluntary contributions and maybe premium services to corporate members. So please let me know if you need more information and uh, thanks for the opportunity to share my thoughts on this. Thanks, Lola. Thank you very much, Francois, um, for bringing us to the point where we can now start having um, uh, the discussion with everyone. Um, please feel free to put questions into the question and answer box while I, you know, sort of just uh, pick on some of the very interesting things that Francois talked about. There's a lot in there to, to unpack. Um, and I, I would start, I would take the liberty of starting, um, you know, to ask questions to the panelists as we just, uh, you know, expect your questions. Um, but just, it's interesting to hear, you know, what, what Francois refers to as consequence management um, for, um, you know, pr the procurement specialists and officers or, or people in the procurement supply chain in, in South Africa. I dare say, um, that just looking around the continent, uh, again, you know, we conducted a research recently to just see, um, you know, what's going on in regards to uh, corruption and procurement. And um, of all the countries we looked in, uh, about seven countries, um, South Africa is where there's been a lot of uh, negative consequences for uh, the people involved, even highly placed people like the spokeswoman of the um, if I'm not mistaken, the current president who's been uh, investigated for about a $7 million contract to supply PPEs that, um, you know, she wasn't uh, qualified to supply. Um, but there's not that much uh, in investigation in some other countries. And so I'm glad to see that there is swift response in South Africa and the civic uh, monitoring is alert and alive and even demanding for, for more. It's also very interesting that you bring up the tensions, and this is where I want to um, throw the question open. I'll start with uh, Professor Chopin, um, and anyone can jump in, um, any one of the panelists can jump in about this, but it's, it's also interesting, um, you know, when you talk about, Francois did bring this up, um, about the issue of um, pub 
putting information out to the public. So, you know, the, the government being careful about or sensitive about information that's published um, related to bids. And we are trying to get to a more competitive, transparent procurement system um, to really help tackle um, anti-corruption. But there is also, you know, um, the need to ensure that there is a competition um, amongst businesses. And so the question about, um, you know, transparency and putting out enough information from the government's perspective um, is, is one that I, I haven't encountered. I've encountered uh, businesses and companies not being willing to put a lot of information, especially ar around pricing in their tenders, um, you know, for competition, competition reasons, um, but also because as we've seen in Kenya in the past, recently during in the COVID-19 um, investigation going on, um, you know, other companies basically steal this information and then that tender process is canceled. And then these other politically com uh, connected companies bid with information of other companies. And that deters businesses um, from providing information during um, uh, calls for tender. So two, two questions I'm, I'm asking about, how do we resolve this tension where there is um, uh, a reluctance to be fully transparent, provide um, sufficient information um, from the government and from the b businesses that are bidding um, in a tender process. So uh, I'll, I'll throw this to Dr. Chopin. Okay. Um, hi, thanks for that. Right, so in, in terms of that kind of information, which is, is commercially sensitive, we, I mean, th there's no system where those, that information is put out until after a contract is concluded, right? So in terms of pricing, it's that information is not given out, is not publicly available until after a contract is actually concluded. Because yes, we recognize that it's commercially sensitive, but um, if that information is not given out, then we don't know um, you know, we don't, we, we won't know a number of things which are crucial. We won't know, A, obviously what was paid versus what was, you know, offered, um, or rather what, what was required by, by the public agency. And we also will not know how much the government is spending. Um, so that information is important, but there's a, there's a timing issue. It can, there are times that it can be put out within the process that makes it, you know, makes it, um, makes it necessary. Um, so yeah, so that's what I would say to that, that it is information um, that needs to be put out, but it's a timing issue. Brilliant. Um, Car yeah, Carrie, do you want to respond to that? Go ahead. No, I was going to ask if I could jump in. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think that's exactly right. And um, I'm actually going to pop into the chat. So we did a report uh, maybe about a year ago looking at, um, we called it a myth busting report. So we looked at the common myths um, for non-publication of information um, coming from both government and private sector. Principally, those are the two sort of sides um, as they are the two that have information that tends to come out um, directly in through the contracting process. Um, so I've just, oh, I just sent that just to Professor Williams, so I will send it to everyone. Um, but we looked at some of the biggest um, myths that are out there or arguments for confidentiality um, and were able to do a bunch of research from looking at instances globally and were able to bust the myths. Um, so able, <clears throat> we found nine times out of 10. Yes, of course, commercial confidentiality makes sense as well as um, issues of personal privacy and security. Um, but beyond that, a lot of the common arguments um, don't actually hold up. And we were able to find examples of places where even in sectors like defense spending, which is often one that's pointed to, um, the vast majority of that information is not actually sensitive and so can be published. Um, so I think it depends a bit on the scope, um, but that I've, I've just shared the resource in the chat and that might um, be of interest to, to some folks on this call. That's very good to know. Okay, so that's very helpful. We will, all of these reports that are being shared, we will collect them and certainly email them to everyone on the call. If you're not in our mailing list, please feel free to drop your email in the chat box and we'll certainly snap that up and um, uh, also send you links to these reports that Carrie's sharing. Thank you so much, uh, Carrie and uh, Professor Chopin. And um, I was going to ask a follow-up question of you, Carrie, but I see that 
Uh, we have a question from P. Glover, I think that's Peter Glover. And um, it does touch on the question I wanted to ask you. And I think uh, Professor Chopin started to respond to that. So uh, let me read it out and we can, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll suggest, Carrie, if you don't mind um, going first and then we'll, um, uh, we'll have either Dr. Chopin or Francois jump in as well. So it's one thing, this is the question. It's one thing to develop an electronic procurement system, but it's another to build up the e-governance infrastructure around it. What, are, what other e-governance platforms such as asset declaration systems and beneficial ownership systems ought to be built and integrated with an electronic procurement system? What are the typical bottlenecks when it comes? So I think it's a two-part question. Let's deal with the first one and then, um, and then I'll read the second one after that. So the first question um, would be, what other e-governance governance platforms such as asset declaration systems and beneficial ownership systems ought to be built and integrated with an electronic procurement system? Sure, I can take a stab and then of course, um, Francois and Professor Williams, um, I know have, have ideas to contribute to this as well. Um, I think in an ideal world, and then that speaks to the second part of the question that we haven't gotten to yet, but I think in an ideal world, <clears throat> there are many different systems that should be um, if not interoperable, at least speak to each other. Um, and in my remarks, I mentioned that when we think about, from Open Contracting Partnerships perspective, when we think about the contracting process, it's not just the tender and the contract itself, but it's starting with the planning through tender, award, contract, and then including through delivery. And that includes both physical progress and financial progress or payments. And so if you think about all of that, at the planning process, you would have budgeting systems, um, and then procurement plans that would go ideally through the procurement system. Um, and then during the, the tender award part, um, as well as the, the contract itself, um, that tends to be within the e-procurement system. Um, but then of course, that's where beneficial ownership comes in. And um, I think a lot of the work that we've been doing um, is thinking about how can we link up with the, the efforts to improve beneficial ownership transparency I think there's been a lot of points already that have come up in this conversation about why that's important. And it's sort of been thrust even more into the spotlight um, in, during the COVID-19 pandemic as well, when you see politically exposed people and others that are, um, should not be getting contracts that, that are because the, the focus is elsewhere. Um, so I think that's a big one. And then including a lot of the work that we've done in, in countries around the world is making sure that the procurement system speaks to the financial management system, whether it's an IFMA system or otherwise, so that you can see when payments are being made. And that's a huge issue that, of course, um, is of importance to, to private sector companies. If payments are not made on time, then they won't get their money. And what's the point of bidding on a government contract if it takes five years to get paid? Um, so being able to join up all of those and sort of follow the money through that entire process, I think, is the ideal scenario. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, would you like to jump in, Dr. Chopin? Um, yeah, so I think, I think the only thing that I'll add to that is, is I think a comment I made that I think now um, African countries need to be looking at the idea of having open digital ecosystems in the public sector. Um, because, and those are basically systems that are built to be, you know, to be um, interoperable with, with any other system where developers make them that way. Um, so for instance, India um, developed an, an, an open digital, um, we call it an open digital economy in relation to um, vehicle licensing, purchase registration, so that if you buy a, a vehicle, all the information relating to insurance is available to the specific you know, government departments that deal with that. Um, so it's very easy to see when, whether you've insured your car, whether your license is up to date, whether your um, driving license is up to date, all on the same platform. Um, and that reduced transaction costs, reduced the cost to consumers as well. Um, of course, there's some issues there because obviously that data is very valuable and can be misused. But in terms of, of um, I think, customer service, dealing with the pub or, or public sector, or rather, in terms of private citizens dealing with the public sector, it was really a, a game changer. So you don't have to go to different 
um, agencies, organizations to get things done because you can do it in one place because all the systems are linked up. Um, so I'm, I think that more and more, these are, these are some of the systems that we need to be thinking about because that working in silos, having one department, having its own system that doesn't talk to any other system, um, it's, it's just crazy in terms of where we are. With We talk about 4IR all the time, but we've not seen any of it in relation to our, our engagements with the public sector. And I, I don't think it's really, it's, I, I think for me, I don't think it's necessarily a financial issue. So it's not really the lack of resource, but I think the fact that those types of systems will cut a lot of the scope for corruption, for abuse, will cut them right out. And they are really, really um, very strong vested interests that will not allow that to happen. So I think that until citizens decide, you know what, enough is enough, um, and we actually drive the train and not let, you know, um, the handful of politicians dictate which way our money is spent, um, you know, that, that we're not going to have any movement on that. But I think it's, this is really necessary and it's, it's right for that. Um, I, I mentioned one of the scandals in, in Hao Teng province where they, they spent there's two billion of health contracts which are, 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 were, were, are under investigation. And that two billion, the government actually allocated only 21 billion rand for the health response. And of that, two billion has gone missing. So this is it's crazy, right? We can't continue to allow this to, to, to be going on and, and yeah. So, uh, I don't think it's a financial issue. If we have two billion to throw away, then we definitely have money. <laughs> we definitely have money to, to upgrade our systems. But I think making sure that our systems are open, um, are interoperable, um, uh, is is key. I'll stop there. Well, um, can I maybe contribute something? Absolutely, Franco. I was just going to bring you into the conversation and even say you can start talking about the second part of the question because Shopper has taken us there. Um, so please, when you're talking, when you're responding, um, you know, to the question about what else do we need to have to support, an, you know, a procurement system, a, a sound procurement system, also talk about, you know, what, what, do we, what are the hindrances to that? Um, what are the typical bottlenecks to that? And, and uh, we, Shafei has there talking about that, which is political will, and we'll dive into that a little bit. So please do, do chime in and, and um, answer all the parts of the question. Thanks, Lola. I think you, you know, the first part of the question asks for a level of sophistication and let's say ethical questions to be answered that doesn't exist today. You know, I, I would love to see a beneficial ownership um, principle being applied in the information that is published. But uh, frankly, I don't think we are there yet. And you know, there's, there's some water to go under the bridge for for everybody to come on board, um, even bef before you look at the practicality of making that work. Um, years ago, we were in a, in a very fortunate position in, in the Western Cape where, where we were managing their supply database on a shared basis across all the departments and some municipalities. And with the preferential procurement legislation at the time, we were mandated to have IDs from owners shareholders in, in these supplier companies, which made it very easy. It wasn't implemented at, at the time, but the principle was easy to implement. Today, we don't have that. In, in no system in the country or anywhere else that I've seen, we have that level of beneficial information. However, we, can, we, 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 we all, always should start with what we have. And we have the principle of accountability. There's an there's a, there's a accounting officer that ultimately accountable and has to make sure that to use whatever means they have to make sure that the process works uh, you know so efficiently and you know with that as the basis i think those accounting officers should make sure that they employ all means to the available to them in order to make sure that there's control over the process now what are those things um, you know the, the question has been asked about what are the bottlenecks i think firstly we need to make sure that there's um, sufficient, sufficient process governance, that the approval over tender specifications, bid specifications, the evaluation stage, and the um, adjudication or award stage, that those, those approvals are recorded properly, that, that we know who is accountable for that step in the, 
in the process. So when the fingers start pointing somewhere down the line, that we can go back to that record and say, these are the individuals that were responsible for that stage. Where did it go wrong? We can go back to, to, to those individuals and they are accountable for what they were doing at, at that time. So if you want to get more sophisticated, we should always follow the golden thread of information in the procurement execution stage. If we talk about e-procurement systems from, um, I think Professor Williams Elegby alluded to the, the follow the money or maybe it was Kerry, say so follow the money for, for the, the, the golden thread, as I call it, the link between purchase order or contract on the, on, on the front through to the, the, the good receipt, through to the invoice um, that was ultimately submitted and now we need to review how much should we pay the supplier. If you have a system that's sophisticated enough to, to, to link all those elements together and they sound simple, but in, in practice, uh, it gets a lot more complex than that. Um, you know, one purchase order doesn't always have one invoice. You know, somewhere along the line, we, we dropped a few lines and, and the supplier couldn't supply all of those. So there's always some, there's always a, a list of exceptions. But if we get sophisticated enough to follow that golden thread, then you know, we, can, we can close a lot of the bottlenecks. Uh, other hurdles are the quality of master data. Um, item master data is, is crucial, the, the quality of that in, in managing a procurement system often um, neglected, often uh, misunderstood uh, because um, you know, people want the, 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 the principles to be implemented, but they're not willing to do the, the, the hard work in order to get sufficient um, implementation. And so that's where that comes back to, to my point earlier is that implementation is where we are lacking. And then, um, Another complexity is the alignment of org structure and delegations to the approvals inside a system like that. So it's easy to, to assign uh, a accountability to an individual at a fairly high level, but as soon as you drop down the organization, um, you need to make sure that the, um, that the organization structure aligns with the, uh, with the delegations and, and approvals. And unfortunately, in organizations like uh, public sector, the, the turnover of staff is relatively high and you know, the upkeep of that level of detail is, is often a, a challenge. I've, I've said a lot, but you know, what, I'm, what I'm saying to you is the devil is in the detail. Eh? You, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, you know, to, to go back to um, the, the first you know, bottleneck we talked about, because it's true, it's a procurement management, um, and procurement systems requires very um, methodical, uh, systematic efforts to uh, make sure that there's transparency and there's accountability from the beginning to the end. And so there's a lot to tease out in there, but let me go back, first of all, um, to, to the question of vested interest, because to, to um, you know, implement procurement reforms, it's you would need uh, you know the right laws. Um, you would need to make sure that the uh, your presentation, Francois, started with the laws available and the implementation. Um, and um, one of the challenges I know that uh, we've we've had in Nigeria, um, in in Ukraine, relating to uh, defense contracting, is really around um, the the political will. And vested interest is, uh, is one term that I learned, I heard about for the first time from the former um, central bank governor in Nigeria. And I just want to um, allow Dr. Chopin to talk a little bit about, um, you know, just basically how, because that's the one million question. How do we create um, a win-win um, situation in countries where um, there are more let's, for the purpose of this conversation, say bad bidders, meaning bidders with a political connection or bidders who um, don't necessarily have to compete on the same level, on a level playing field, because if it's with the government, they know that they'll get their money without challenges because they have political collection, right? And um, in, in countries like Nigeria, where good bidders don't want to bid because they're worried whether the government would pay at the end of the day, so they will rather stay away from a tender process, or they feel it's not transparent enough, the risk of having to pay a bribe 
to be considered on the same playing field level, on the same level as other competitors, um, it's just not worth the time. Um, and so they stay away. However, there is a chance that, you know, you can attract more um, good bidders. And the only way to do that is to create a win-win situation for, you know, for the good bidders and the government in this case, or, or the citizens. So I want to just, let's talk a bit about that. What's, what sort of reforms or um, instruments um, can be considered to encourage uh, bidders that are not politically connected, um, reduce the risk of bidding in, in countries like uh, Nigeria or in countries where you need to be politically connected um, to be successful in bidding for large government pro uh, pro programs or projects? Um, right. Okay. So I, I'll, I'll first I'll say this off the bat that we don't need legal reform um, because we, you know, the laws are, are fairly standard. Um, the Nigerian, if you talk about the Nigerian situation, the our public procurement act is based on the Aung Sutral model law, which is 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 you know widely accepted as as you know as a global standard. So I, I don't think legal reform is is necessary, um, and also I don't think legal reform will really change anything because our laws are only as good as their implementation, and the problem is with the implementation. Now, Nigeria is is sort of an unusual case, and. An, and having lived in Nigeria and having, you know, lived in, in, and worked in South Africa as well, um, I think that with, with Nigeria, the, the, the government is less, um, let me say the, the government is less honest about their intentions when it comes to public procurement. <laughs> let me put it that way. So you, you talk about, you know, having bidders that don't have, have any, connection to governments and, and trying to encourage them to bid. And <laughs> um, I think that we, we can only have that situation if we have more involvement of civil society and, and the citizens, because that is not really going to come from the government. Even though we advertise contracts, and I've been, you know, I've worked, um, you know, I've, I've worked alongside the Bureau of Public Procurement. I was even a a member of, of my university's um, tender committee. I've been involved in quite a number of government contracts. And even though you have the appearance of competition, I'll say ninety five percent of the time it's a fait accompli. So. The government is not going to be, or the public agencies are not going to be the ones that will help us to get um, neutral bidders into the system because that is not going to be their, to their advantage. I think the only way we can do that is if we have more pressure coming from civil society, more demands coming from citizens. So where we are right now with procurement, especially in relation to the openness of data, has, has really been as a result of the demands of civil society. So some of the um, organizations that, that Carrie mentioned, Budeshi, um, the um, P, or PP, I forget the, the name, that, <laughs> that one, <laughs> PPDS, PP, yes, aha, PPDC. Um, and um, um, Budeshi, PPDC, and there's another one they have put a lot of pressure. They've taken any data that was available and they've made that accessible to the public so that citizens can actually have an idea, wow, this is actually going on in my local community. And that has, has actually created movement around um, requests for accountability um, and in, in, in public procurement in Nigeria. So I think we, if we looked for to, to the public sector to do these things, when the public sector is a huge part of the problem, for me, of course, there's some things that we cannot do without the public sector, but the things that definitely we can do without the public sector, then we should do them on our own and not leave this, um, you know, not ab absorb this responsibility, if you like, and expect that the public sector who are profiting from the system and have ensured that that system is maintained are going to do anything to fix it. They're not. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'll say that civil society needs to continue to push. We need to continue to 
find ways to, to, to fund legitimate civil society organizations who are you know, really dedicated to, to this task. Because again, in Nigeria, civil society organizations, um, we don't have a culture of, 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 of you know, regular people donating to those types of organizations. You know, of course, if you say you, know, um, you need to, um, organizations that maybe feed the poor, people are used to that, but organizations that track government spending are not as, um, you know, they're not as sexy. Um, so those organizations actually having the wherewithal to actually do their work, again, is, is an issue that, that, that stifles what they can do or how much they can do and, and, and it's something that we all need to, to, to be involved in. But yeah, so I would say that it's not really, a, um, solutions are not going to come from the public sector. That's been my experience. So it's really down to the citizens, the civil society to, to take up that battle. Thank you so much, Dr. Shokai. Carrie, would you like to uh, comment here? Because, I mean, um, where you sit is really where civil society is the most active in different countries. And it would be interesting to hear your um, perspective on how civil society, what, what the you know, levers have been um, in the countries where you've been the most successful, where civil society has been successful in achieving reform, what levers um, have been pulled um, or, or, or used to, to drive, you know, the demand for procurement reform and, and you know, what successes have there been? Um, I know you've talked about Nigeria and Ukraine, you know, I'm really keen on hearing more um, about that, about Ukraine, especially where there's the interesting um, e-procurement platform that's uh, um, almost a model for, for other countries now. Sure, and happy to speak to, to those two um, in particular, and if there are other countries of interest, um, just, just let me know. Um, Nigeria, I think, is an awesome example. Um, for those who don't know, the idea of open contracting, open procurement is now um, sort of a huge issue across Nigeria, both at federal <clears throat> level and across um, most of the states, many at least. Um, and so it's really sort of taken off and all of that um, sort of stemmed from this effort that uh, Professor Williams mentioned. Um, it's called Budeshi, which means open it in house in one of the local languages. Um, and it was really civil society through various means, especially freedom of information requests, cobbling together information and then publishing that. And they did an online comparison of budgets versus final contract amounts and were able to identify um, several red flags of uh, potential instances of corruption um, in uh, sort of across the country and then followed that up with sending, they have now sort of a, an army, if I can, of, of monitors that actually go out into the field to check on projects that are meant to be being delivered and make sure that those are actually, um, you know, if, if it's a school that it's actually built to scale and there's a roof on it and it's being used and whatnot. Um, and have been reporting back to government and working with government to get any issues that they've identified resolved. Um, it's been a, a bit of a work in progress, but um, it's a, a really inspiring example. And I'm happy to to pop a link in the chat um, for those that are that are interested in more. Um, and I think as a result of those efforts, they then actually convinced um, BPP, the Bureau of Public Procurement, has come up a couple of times. Um, but convince them of the power of this. And so the Bureau of Public Procurement has now developed um, the Nigerian Open Contracting Portal, or NOCOPO, which they steward and, and publish information there on their website. Um, again, that is also a work in progress. Um, so uh, iteratively improving that as we go. Um, but it's a, a pretty interesting example of where civil society really started this now national movement. Um, in Ukraine, so Ukraine is an especially interesting example. Um, it came out of, there was a revolution in 2014, I believe, um, that was in part against what was seen as a corrupt um, administration. And as a result of that, um, there was this sort of coming together of a new government that was more willing to be better, do better, work with other stakeholders. Um, a civil society that was willing to support this new government um, and then private sector I think there were, there were guys living in Silicon Valley that moved back to Ukraine to sort of help work with others to, to rebuild the system. And they created something called Prozoro, which is a national e-procurement system that's built um, around the open contracting data standard, which is an open data schema that I, chat, I bumped, popped a link to it in the chat, but it explains what information 
um, ideally should be published across the entire procurement process. Um, so they work together to create this, um, this system that in the five, six years since it's launched, it's already seen billion dollars in savings. They've had um, an enormous uptick in the number of companies that are willing to, to bid on government contracts. Um, they've seen a massive increase, especially among small and medium-sized enterprises that are now bidding on government contracts. Um, and there's also, similar to Nigeria, an army of monitors called Dozoro, working with the Prozoro team to actually monitor um, on the ground the, the, the spending and the contracts that are, that are being awarded and delivered. Um, so also a really inspiring example and happy to share um, articles that we've written up on that as well. And I hope that got to your question, Lola. Not sure if there was something specific that, that you had in mind that I didn't cover, but happy to. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Carrie. We have, um, we have just about seven minutes to wrap up. Um, Franco, I wanted to give you a chance to actually to, to, you know, talk about this a little bit from your, um, from your perspective, because what I see, you know, you doing with Tender Just is um, really what Shopway and Carrie are, are really suggesting that we do. Um, don't don't wait for the government because really that there's there's no win situation for um, the you know vested interests um, in the government um, and so there is there'll be no motivation to make the procurement system efficient um, and as transparent as you know we have all talked about um, but you're starting um, with tender just which would really create um, more transparency for especially the small and mid-sized businesses that are involved in um, government tendering. And, you know, it'd be interesting to just have you talk a little bit about how you see tender just solving um, the current problems in, uh, in the procurement system or in South Africa as, you know, as it is um, in terms of the, you know, lack of access to, to information or basically the, you know, fragmented, um, channels of collecting or receiving information and following up with uh, with questions and and basically making sure that the right people win um, tenders and and people are able to report problems. Yes, Lola, thanks. Uh, the, you know, this journey started uh, about three years ago when I was engaged by the National Treasury to conduct a survey amongst government suppliers to just gauge the impression of what it was like doing business with government. And we, so, and, and it was a rather large study. We invited about 290,000 suppliers and received 45,000 responses. Um, and apart from the usual suspects of late payments, uh, access to opportunities, um, you know, just those, it is difficult to do business with government aspects. Um, the one thing that, uh, that, that struck me most was how small businesses were suffering at grassroots level with corruption and, and how they've almost given up hope of doing business with government. And then on the other side, we see reports on the news of you know, lack of service delivery, you know, education, health, uh, you know, general sanit sanitation type uh, projects that do not deliver housing um, and the sad stories there that that really happen as a result of the system not working and that that was the motivation and I, I sat back and said what do I have how can I contribute to this and it's taken us a bit of time because um, you know it's it's uh, it's all been done on, on, on the side but uh, but ultimately I think the lesson that I've learned from civil society through the last let me say four or five years is that we can make a difference on the ground if we start doing things ourselves. Uh, Hi, Francois, can you still hear us? We may have lost Francois for a few minutes there. Um, but we have three more minutes to go. Let's see if uh, let's see if we can call back in to to wrap up on that thought. Um, 
I don't think we have any more questions, um, but we have a lot of fantastic um, resources. So we will certainly share those resources. I'll take the last three minutes to allow our panelists to um, say quick final words. This has been interesting. I certainly want to continue this conversation and I'm sure Dr. Shope and Carrie will tell you when we have a chance to speak. If it's a 20 minutes call, we wind up, we end up speaking for a little longer than that. So this has been very interesting for me and I know it's been a short conversation, but um, we hope that we can continue this conversation because procurement reform is important, um, terribly important. And COVID-19 has definitely shown us um, that we do need to prioritize procurement reform or you know, maybe not reform in Nigeria where we have all the good laws, but really you know, support civic monitoring in, in, in our procurement process across all the countries where we are. Um, so I'll just uh, give Carrie um, a minute to say some final words and then to Professor Shope, and then hopefully we have Francois back um, before we wrap up this afternoon. So Carrie, please go ahead. Sure, thanks. And, and first of all, a huge thank you again for the invitation and, and the really interesting conversation. Um, I think as, as you rightly mentioned, Lola, this is really, this whole crisis has really thrust procurement into the spotlight. Um, and it has shown the need to, to ensure that procurement reform, whether it's reforming the laws or reforming systems themselves, um, there really is a need to make sure that it's um, effective and, and accountable. Um, and so, I think I'll just reiterate my uh, my interest and offer to speak with anyone that that wants to know more um, about our work either in Nigeria or South Africa or further afield. Um, I think especially thinking about moving from the COVID response into the recovery where this will continue to be important. Um, it's something that we're really actively thinking about and, and keen to to sort of join forces with with others that are thinking about this and working on it to make sure that we build back better. So thank you again. Okay, um, thank you also for inviting me. It has been really interesting to, to meet Carrie and to meet Francois and, and as well. Um, for me, I think what I'll say is that, um, and this is a call to action for, for everyone, wherever you are in your country, take an interest in what is happening in the public sector, take an interest in what's happening in procurement, it is our business, it is our money, and you know, we have every right to demand better. Um, it's not, um, you know, we shouldn't, I think as citizens, we should never um, abdicate our responsibility to demand accountability, to demand for, um, you know, to, to demand answers when we have questions, and that we should keep pushing those buttons, keep supporting civil society organizations, um, and you know, don't, don't, don't let your, your foot off the gas. Uh, until things are the way you want to see them. So that's what I'll say. Excellent, thank you. And, and Francois, we had, uh, we lost you for a minute there, but we were just taking final uh, comments from the panelists. Uh, I don't think we still, we have Francois. Well, thank you so much. This is a very good note to, to end this conversation. Thank you very much to Dr. Chope. Um, thank you to Carrie. Um, Thank you to Francois in absentia. Um, we did get quite a lot of questions, quite a few um, uh, comments in the box and uh, links to um, resources that, uh, that Carrie shared. So we will certainly scoop those up and send those to everyone on the call. If you are in the ACGC, that's the Anti-Corruption um, and Governance Center at SIPES mailing list, you will receive um, the links to this uh, webinar. Uh, the links in the in the chat box, and you you could also receive uh, the recording to the webinar if you um, if you would like. So thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. For those of you who are um, in Africa um, or or in the same time zone as I am, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. For everyone else whose day is just starting, thank you so much again to our panelists. We really enjoyed the conversation, and we look forward to keeping our foot our feet on the gas and keeping the conversation going. Thank you so much.